Alright, for our next reader is Lauren Parker. <laughs> when the end times come, Lauren Parker won't be surprised. <laughs> Her compound will be outfitted with enough pasta and cat food to last decades. As a benevolent but totalitarian leader of her compound, Lauren will stand as judge and executioner when need be. She will crush the skulls of trespassing men with her thighs. <laughs> All we can do now is offer her our admiration and hope that, when the time comes, we will be invited to the compound and that our behavior there will be to her satisfaction. Please welcome Lauren Parker. Huh? That's not a tall night. <laughs> Okay, so Meg, I just want to say that if I didn't totally love you, I'd absolutely hate you. <laughs> Congratulations, baby. <laughs> okay, so you know that fanfiction writer who's like, I'm in the universe, but I'm not in the universe. I just painfully ripped it off, but it's totally different. I'm going to do that tonight. So. <laughs> it's not Tolkien, it's Tolkien-like. <laughs> All of the men were dead, to begin with. <laughs> Their tombstones stained and ignored like rotting teeth in the small cemetery outside of town in what was once called the Middle West. No one knew its original name, it was just Bereaveland now. <laughs> the lake had dried up into a cracked wasteland like the hands of the washing women, resigned to cleaning their clothes in the small river with water so harsh their hands were scarred red from the blisters. You know, I heard in the old times they caught the river on fire twice, little Nora <laughs> said, looking out into the narrow strip of moving sludge of the Cuyahoga, as murky and viscous as a young one's first blood. <laughs> The fire had indeed burned, and the fish all had rocks in their bodies, nodules as hard and round as the candy that old women would talk about, wrapped in tiny slivers of cellophane and cracked like glass under your teeth. The old women spoke of these mythical sweets like they were friendly treasures, but to the young ones, candy were as real as orchards, bounty, or fairies. None of that existed now, and some of it never had, and it was impossible to know the difference. So they ate around the cancer. The tumors making good marbles or could be smashed into poultices for pox. It didn't work. But medicine was largely faith now. Belief and hope confused for the same language. You've told that story 100 times, Helen said, tossing a gasping fish extracted from the river into a tall reedy basket, blackened with mildew and mud. It landed with a smack on top of other gasping fish, their backs broken and gills fluttering. The gun holster on her side pressed against her and caused her to sweat. She hated the thing, but it wasn't smart to work this close to the forest without one. Everyone in Bereaveland was taught to shoot. You never knew when you would need it. Every story had been told hundreds of times. It was the only way to make history live on. It was important to the old women that the young ones didn't think it was, had always been this way, that there had once been other times with flowers and candies and fairies and cellophane. Helen, no more than 16 sons, was not entirely sure what existed beyond Bereaveland. The forests had grown back after the fires had gone out, and the trees had formed a formidable border. It wasn't just cancerous fish, but all sorts of old world was damaged beyond repair. What had once been bears, their flesh burned back so far it hid under their bones, white exoskeleton and tempers bitter with hunger. That's what survival did. It transformed you until all that was left were hard bits, bitterness, and the knowledge of your own stomach. No one went into the woods except for the painted ones, patrolling on horseback and coming back with goods, food, or children. They all wore leathers, while others trade while other trades wore cloth. And they were called painted because everyone was adorned with blue tapestries of ink covering their bodies. There, there was only one flower that had managed to survive, a yellow one used to make blue woad called Asp of Jerusalem. All cloth was indigo, and the painted ones chiseled the ink into themselves. It was said that the woad burned going in and left their markings patchy and scarred, but that painted ones had always done this for as long as anyone could remember, so they continued to do it despite the dangers and ugliness. They rubbed their hair and skin with oil pressed from the only crop that grew, a stubborn relic of the past, yellow corn. <laughs> <laughs> the painted ones had many secrets and there were many reasons for the blue and gray swirls along their arms, but no one knew what they were, not even their daughters. 
Helen had always feared them. There was something in their markings that presented fearlessness, and something in their eyes that shined knowledge. She didn't know what a person could possibly do to become an, the, such an ornamented creature, as inky as an omen. There were no good omens anymore. No record of them had survived. They had been shouted down by foreboding. Helen was fishing for carp with rocks in their bodies when the men came. The men were not quiet as they pushed through the bramble, scratching and bleeding, their clothes insufficient against the chill of the day. They must have been out overnight because their cheeks were burned as if by frost. The middle one appeared to be dead. His body both limp and stiff, his lips chalky. He would smell soon. They had hours left, if that. Enough people died in Bereavel that everybody was taught to treat the dead. Helen still had memories, childhood memories triggered by the rattling scent of decomposition. The other two were reasonably alive, dragging their friend's feet behind them like a plow. One was tall, his muscles looping like rope under his skin, red hair as red as the Cuyahoga River, and he looked at Helen with a hard amusement, his smile low and gentle, his eyes holding the same hunger of survival that the painted ones and bears had. Where do you come from, said Eunice. She was not the imposing warrior, but hovered around 5'4", her chin a patchy blue that faded down her neck and into her shirt her arms lined with the react with recreations of bones. Helen knew enough about butchering fish to recognize the swoop of their fin bones, enough in patchy scarred ink. It must have been agony going in. The shores of the pit, the man said with, with red hair said, releasing the grip on the wrist, the wrist of the dead man. We had heard of a city of women, but we didn't believe it existed. Helen wanted to keep looking at him. She had thought all the men were dead and that none existed at all, and here three, well, two, <laughs> technically stood, and she was not sure if they were pretty. They were coarse, their hair unbraided, the hair on their faces as knotted as vines. She was confused and wary and excited. Who told you of our city? city? Eunice held a gun, one of the few treasures Bereav Linslow had left between his eyes. Legend, mostly. Why are you marked like that? He reached out to touch Eunice's face. She cocked the gun. Absolutely not, she said. Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> my apologies. I'm Archer, and this is my friend Chester and my friend Frank. We are technicians and explorers trying to rebuild the technology of the old world. Strangers had arrived at the edges of Bereavel in the four, of course. Most residents were from elsewhere, dropped into the forest because they were loud enough to wake the dead or ate enough to ruin a family. They were abandoned for being too much additional surplus. The painted ones brought them in. Some of them even survived. None ever go near the forest. You know the ones that have been saved from it. They avoided the strongest. But no men had ever arrived. Some women, mostly girls, but no boys and no men. Not ever in Helen's memory. Your friend appears to be dead, said Eunice. She had tattooed feathers above her eyebrows and they were meeting her hairline. Yes, our plane went down in the forest. Our friend has suffered some injuries. The body stank of shit and blood. Eunice and the cluster of painted ones looked at the body. You got here in a plane? Eunice asked. We tried. It's something we were trying to fix from the old world. I, I can take you if you want to tend to my friend. Fluid began to pour out of the body and wetly hit the grass. You do understand that man is dead, right? Eunice asked. Are you a healer? He asked. No? Then let's just try a few bandages and see what happens. My brother came back from the dead once. I fully believe in the restorative power of a bandage and some herbs. <laughs> <laughs> Eunice was speechless, her face twisted in annoyance. She looked like she was going to shoot him. <laughs> Why don't we just head to your infirmary, and my friend Chester here will take you back to, to the forest and to the plane. Chester immediately blanched. I have to go back in there? <laughs> It'll be fine. Just take these nice ladies with you into the forest, and I'll just bring our friend Frank up here to the medical center. Archer winked at Helen. I'll take them, Helen said. Okay, but like that man is dead. You know, so, as, as she and three others followed Chester into the forest, they disappeared into the brush, no sun cutting through the trees. The infirmary was an ancient pop-up camper, with every bit replaced with deer hide, wooden whittled nuts and bolts, and the siding had been eaten away by weather, time, and the beetles that held at night. You can put him here, Helen said of, of the body of the very dead man. There were several cots, all empty, and the spring had been kind, and not too many were sick and dying. Helen and Archer sat in the infirmary tent. He stooped, even sit uh, he stooped even sitting to fit inside, his knees folded up against his chest. His sighs threatened her. 
She makes the poultice of fish tumors, grinding it up with a stone bowl that had been ransacked from an old world, old world Mexican restaurant in a large smooth rock. <laughs> she spread the mixture onto the cold body, the skin refusing to absorb it. I heard this place existed and I wanted to believe, Archer said, looking at Helen. She had seen these looks before in the faces of young women before they snuck off with their friends. It was desire. She'd know it anywhere. Because yes, in this feminist dystopia, women absolutely fuck. <laughs> Thank you very much. Lesbian island fucks, okay? <laughs> Officially canon. <laughs> I have never heard of the place that you're from. I didn't even know there was anything beyond the forest. I thought maybe the sea had eaten it all. If not sea, then the fire that left nothing for the sea to eat. My home is wonderful. It's not like here. The living is not so rough. He looked around the camper, pointing at craft work that Helen had done herself. <laughs> when the world started to collapse, the fires uh, beat back the ocean, and it rode, into, and it rode across the, the land and stopped at Pitt. We now can all swim in the beautiful body of the water. <laughs> Helen was offended, but something in her told her not to say anything. She was not sure what men did when challenged. <laughs> she, he seemed wild and loud, like the bears of the forest. Maybe this home really was better? She had heard that in the old world, Bereavland, a place where the river caught fire, was not much to look at. <laughs> are there women in your city? She asked politely. There are many women where I'm from, the beautiful shores of Pitt. It's better than Bereavland, I promise you. There is more food, and the fires didn't burn the museum so we can look at art. And we have this giant blue stockade. It's called Ikea. <laughs> and what are the people like there? Everyone must be in a family. It's the right way to be. One man and one woman, who is, <laughs> join us holes. The Lord wants us to keep this way, to remember to center our connection to one another over all else. Everyone must always have someone to keep them warm in bed at night, and someone to lend to them when, tend to them when ill, someone to lean on in times of trouble. This is the Lord's way. Does that make them happy, your people? <laughs> Helen asked. Oh yes, when I choose my wife, she will be part of me and I will be part of her, and neither one of us will be whole without the other. We shall sleep in each other's arms every night and make children from our union. And that makes the women happy? <laughs> Helen asked softly. Of course, women are cherished as rulers of the home. So you know. <laughs> yet everyone must be in a family. Helen just kept smearing creamed fish tumors on the very dead dude out of politeness. <laughs> she had thrown in a bit of woad for good measure to make it blue. It seemed to please Archer, and she always liked it best when she was able to make people smile. Not yet. He smiled at her with that hunger in her body electrified. Chester has a family, and Frank, he pointed at the body on the cot. <laughs> Someday I will choose my bride, and she'll be the most cherished. I will make her happy every single day. We don't have wives here. That is something from the old world. We belong to each other and raise our children together. We share. Archer tried to hold his judgment, but it crept across his face like moss. I have never understood sharing, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you feel more secure knowing someone was completely and totally present with you in your marriage? It's better. It's stronger. It's more than flesh. It is souls touching. It is the holiest thing that has ever existed. He smiled as if remembering something fondly that was now very far away. Helen found him beautiful and wanted to do nothing but look at him and take in every single word he said. The painted ones in Chester were back by nightfall. The men stayed in the infirmary with the sick and totally not dead dude. <laughs> the painted ones were locked in, locked the men, barring the doors with split boards. Helen both understood and didn't understand their suspicions and precautions. She was not sure why she felt both the need to fall open in front of Archer, nor why she wanted to curl up in a ball and be as small as possible. She slept very little that night, imagining what it would be like to be in Archer's arms every night, to unite with him, to be part of him, to bear his children. Pregnant women had turned up in the forest before. They were tended to with incredible care. Her own mother had been one, so grateful to be taken in. She had been a wonderful mother until she had formed stones in her body, the same as the fish. Earth seemed to sprout and kill everything, like it, like it was out for revenge. The family sounded kind of nice. The men stayed a week until Archer was forced to admit that the mass of damp, clammy, maggoty matter was in fact not elaborate illness and genuine death, and that Frank was no more. 
He and Helen spent so much time together, he followed her to fish, commenting on her form and production. <laughs> she found his advice rather useless. <laughs> I liked the sound of his voice. She still wore the gun at her hip. The forest still held its dangers. The men were to leave in the morning, and he and Helen snuck out to walk the river one more time. The sun had begun to peek over the forest. Come away with me, he said, his blue eyes looking into hers like they had owned her. They were as blue as the glassy sea of pit. Be my wife, be one with me, have my children, let us be forever tied and never whole without the other. She had wondered if he would ask, hoped almost, maybe. If she's being honest, she leaned into him, his forehead touching, uh, her forehead touching his, and he sighed and closed his eyes. Their lips met and parted, he moaned into her mouth. Her face flushed, she put her left hand on his side, her right hand on the gun. <laughs> the bullet tore a hole in his belly, and blood poured out of his open mouth as he fell, gasping to the ground in shock and then in pain. His eyes were so blue against the red that smeared all over his lips and wet his cheeks. Again, read Meg's work. <laughs> as blue as the sea of pits, as blue as the sky has once been, as blue as the ink in the skin of the painted ones, as blue as woad. She stayed with him as he died, slowly, his head in her lap. She held him, and for a brief moment he was in her arms, and they were one, souls touching. He bled out long and slow. She shushed him. He took his last breath after a long time. The sun had finished rising, and sweat was forming on her skin. Where is Archer? Chester asked, as he was about to be escorted through the forest to his plane. I'm afraid, Eunice said, he's developed an illness. <laughs> he's in the infirmary. <laughs> Chester didn't ask any more questions, and headed back into the forest, ready rather ready to face off against bears and the likes of these women. <laughs> the first of Helen's ink started under her eyes. It fell down in rivers like the blood from his wounds. She chose to tattoo the great sea of pit. It's true, the woad burns as it goes in, and the wounds scar gray and white like caps of waves. She has the fish bones of her poor mother pricked into her heart, the thin nose of a gun in her hand. Archer was buried in the cemetery with the other men. His stone red and crude chiseling, here lies Archer, and in smaller letters, as if carved tirelessly with a stick underneath read, an attempted slaver who died of sickness. His grave, unlike the others, is well tended, but the only flower laid upon it is the asp of Jerusalem, because that's all that's left. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so I'm on Twitter at Lauren Inc. Uh, I N K. I have a website, LaurenEparker.com, and I'm on Instagram at Fuck Yeah Lauren Parker. <laughs>